So thank you, Avian. So as the title says, uh, I, I will try to discuss uh, the physics of excitons out of equilibrium, and in particular with a focus of uh, what we can do with an ab initio approach. So this is a bit the, the outline of my talk. I will start with uh, the panel in the middle, so the, with the definition of the excitonic creation operator, and then uh, with a discussion of uh, the difference between uh, non-coherent and coherent excitons. And then uh, I will speak about uh, two different ways uh, of uh, uh, modeling excitons out of equilibrium. The first one on the left, uh, is uh, via the definition of a, a phase diagram out of equilibrium, while the second one on the right uh, is uh, about uh, real-time simulation, so how we can uh, really propagate an equation of motion for the density matrix in this case, and uh, describe uh, the generation of accidents. And then on the bottom, I will focus uh, most of my talk, the first part at least, uh, on the detection of accidents in uh, time-resolved uh, ARPES measurements. And then uh, if I will have enough time, I will move uh, to exciton light interaction, that is the, the detection in transient absorption, and finally on uh, exciton phonon interaction, and uh, with a couple of, of examples uh, with, uh, in collaboration with experimental groups. So let me start with a few equations. When we, we want to describe uh, the properties of a material from first principles, usually we start from uh, a, a single particle equation in the framework of uh, density functional theory, where we have uh, an external potential for the electrons due to the ions, and then a local exchange and correlation term, which takes into account of the electron-electron interaction. And then from that, we can also describe uh, the response of the system to an external perturbation, and in particular, the response function in time-dependent density functional theory uh, can be constructed from this uh, Dyson equation where the, the change in the exchange correlation potential with respect to the density enters. So an alternative to density functional theory is many body perturbation theory. And in particular, if we take a, a static approximation for the self energy, we can also write a, a, a single particle equation, let's say with uh, this object, which is non local. And then we can move from the quasi particle equation to describe the response to an external perturbation. And we end up with this Dyson equation, which is also known as the beta salpeter equation. So here I stress the, the importance of having a non-local self-energy, and in particular uh, that the non-local self-energy give uh, the physics of the exciton. So we, via the beta salpeter equation, we can describe the physics of the exciton. Now, since uh, solving the quasi-particle equation with a non-local self-energy is usually very demanding, what we often do is uh, we follow with this path. So we do a DFT ground state cal calculation, then we add uh, uh, self-energy corrections, and then we, we move to the beta salpeter equation. And this is a scheme which works uh, very nicely in many situations, and it is able, in particular, to describe excitonic peaks in absorption at equilibrium. However, one should keep in mind that uh, the correct uh, path to follow is uh, this one, and uh, in particular, that uh, if the physics of the exciton needs to be described, uh, already at uh, the level of, uh, let's say, the, the self-consistent simulations, these uh, R3 plus X self-energies should be used, so in a local self-energy. This is something, for example, which is needed for uh, the excitonic insulator phase, and it is something which I will also use uh, in this talk. So, but first of all, few details on the beta salpeter equation. So this uh, kernel, which enters the Dyson equation, is composed of two terms. Uh, which one is uh, an exchange term for the electron hall, and uh, the other one is uh, an interaction term. So we can recast this Dyson equation as uh, an excitonic Hamiltonian, and then we have uh, a, an eigenvalue problem, which we can solve. And from this, we can, for example, obtain the absorption spectra of materials, uh, including uh, the excitonic peaks. So this, in this example, there is a lithium fluoride, which is, a, let's say, a prototype uh, wide gap insulator, which has a, a strongly bound exciton. So here, the, this is the excitonic peak, and the binding energy is about uh, 2 electron volt. 
we can define uh, an excitonic curator operator, at least in the Tandankov approximation, approximation. And then uh, from this, uh, we can think about uh, having a state uh, which you describe, uh, uh, let's say, the system out of equilibrium if I can create an exciton. Then now, if I want to model uh, pump and probe experiments, uh, the idea is that experimentally they send a laser pulse uh, and uh, they create a, a finite density of uh, non-equilibrium charge or uh, can be non-equilibrium excitons. And here I want to briefly discuss the difference between this state, which I call uh, non-coherent state, and uh, this other state, which uh, I call a coherent state or coherent excitonic state. So let me take just uh, one step back and uh, I change my excitonic operator with just a bosonic operator, let's say the one of the photon. So to show what is the difference uh, between these two states. Now on the left, if I take the, the non-coherent state, this is uh, an English state of uh, the Hamiltonian and of the number of particles. So we have a, a well-defined number of photons in the system. And eventually, if we want to, let's say, describe a situation where uh, I have a fractional occupations of uh, some excitonic state, I can move from uh, this wave function to a mini body density matrix. Now, the, the characteristic of this state, uh, as far as photons are concerned, is that if I take uh, the average of the electric field operator, I get zero. So this is uh, a non-coherent population of uh, photons. And uh, it cannot be, be described, there is no associated electric field. And the situation is different instead if I consider a coherent state. So a coherent state is defined uh, as uh, this uh, funny state, let's say, that is uh, an eigenstate of the annihilation operation, operator. And uh, if one tries to, to write that in, in terms of, uh, let's say, states with a defined uh, well-defined number of, uh, of particle, the expression is this one. So it's a superposition of uh, different states with a different number of particles. And uh, as in the case of the non-coherent state, we have a finite population of uh, photons in this case, but we can just define an average. So it's, it's not an eigenstate state anymore of the number of photons. And uh, the main difference is that now there is uh, a classical uh, variable which can be associated uh, to this state, which is the electric field. And uh, indeed, the, the, this correspondence between uh, the coherent state and the electric field is the reason why we can approximate uh, this kind of state with some, uh, some classical variable. So this is uh, what we do every day in when we do non-equilibrium simulations, uh, for example, TDDFT or also and uh, on equilibrium green functions, what we, when we put a laser uh, pulse, we usually just put the, the classical counterpart. So now we, we go back to the language of uh, the excitons. And uh, also in this case, we have a similar distinction. So this state, which is defined uh, starting from the ground state uh, and applying the, the creation of uh, the, the excitonic uh, create, creation operator, uh, many times is uh, what I call the non-coherent exciton. At the variance with the photons case, uh, this is, a, let's say, an approximate definition or a definition which holds true in, uh, at low density. Because here I am, I'm assuming that the excitonic wave function is well-defined and it doesn't change while I populate the state. So we have this state, which has a finite population of excitons. Uh, and if I compute the polarization on this state, uh, I, get, I get in general zero. And on the other end, I have this uh, coherent excitonic state, which also has a finite population of excitons. But this time, if I do the average of the polarization operator, I get a finite polarization in the system. Now, it can be shown that uh, this, uh, this state uh, can uh, be associated to what is called uh, exciton Bose-Einstein condensation in uh, out of equilibrium, eventually, if the state is uh, not the ground state. Uh, and uh, I mean, in both cases, uh, here the, the formulation also only at low density because I'm, I'm using the, the excitonic operator as if it were uh, the operator of uh, an exact boson. But on this side of the slide, if I start from the coherent state, I can also explicitly put the, my, 
uh, creation of pervector for the exciton, and I can go beyond uh, this low density approximation. So one can show that uh, the, the final result is a BCS-like state for electron and holes, which has this form. And it is again a coherent state in the sense that there is uh, an associated polarization. And this state can be described uh, as uh, a rotation of uh, the basis set. So from my initial basis set of the conduction and valence band, the final state has uh, new creation operators, which one can obtain via a rotation in the space of the states. So this was just a very general introduction that, uh, and then I will uh, take advantage of these concepts uh, to, to discuss instead the, the results of the simulations, uh, which can be done fully ab initio. So in, in this first part, I, I will discuss mostly this work, which uh, was done in collaboration with Enrico Perfetto, Andrea Marini, and Gianluca Stefanucci. And in particular, Enrico was the one doing uh, the theory part. So there is a part uh, which is focused on uh, 2D models. And uh, instead, I was uh, mo mostly working on the ab initio part in this work. So how do we describe uh, excitons uh, out of equilibrium? The, the idea is, as I said, is that we want to solve uh, a self-consistent equation with this uh, R3 plus sex Hamiltonian. So it's important to have this non-local uh, uh, self-energy. But of course, we have a system which at equilibrium doesn't have excitons. So, so the, let's say the procedure we use to describe uh, the non-equilibrium state is to slightly change the Hamiltonian. So we introduce uh, from the, the Arthur sex Hamiltonian, we add these two terms, which, which contain two chemical potential for the electrons and the holes, and these two operators, which are uh, the operators describing uh, the number of electrons in conduction and the number of uh, uh, holes in valence. Now, the idea is that the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, can, uh, is uh, an excited state of the, the Hamiltonian of the system. Now, let me stress that uh, in the case of a real material, uh, this is just uh, an approximated concept because it relies on the introduction of the basis set, the conduction band and the valence band. And it also in particular at low density, I would say, while instead it can be made an exact concept if one takes a two-band model. So indeed in this work, we start from a two-band model where this procedure is exact and then we extend it to, to the case of initial simulations. So, and uh, how it works in practice, we have to solve this Hamiltonian uh, tuning uh, these uh, two chemical potentials. And in particular, what matters is the difference between uh, the chemical potential we add to the holes and the chemical potential we add to the electrons. And one important point is that uh, we, we need to allow symmetry breaking. So we don't have to, to look for solutions which have the same symmetry of the Hamiltonian, but we have to, allow the finding of solution with lower symmetry. And in particular, we can define an order parameter, which is uh, this one. So it's the sum of uh, the off-diagonal com uh, components uh, of the R3 plus X Hamiltonian. And this is what we obtain for uh, lithium fluoride. So this is a plot of this uh, order parameter and uh, as a function of this uh, delta mu, so the difference in between the chemical potential for the electrons and the one of the holes. So in lithium fluoride, as long as we start from zero and uh, as long as uh, we have uh, below this uh, first excitonic peak, uh, the ground state of the, this Hamiltonian is the same uh, as the ground state of the Hamiltonian at equilibrium. However, when we reach uh, the, the first excitonic peak, uh, then the ground state changes. And in particular, uh, there is, uh, let's say, the formation of an order parameter, which is rap rapidly growing. And uh, this, uh, this change can be interpreted as a phase transition. So there is a phase transition, which at low density can be described uh, as a, a Bose-Einstein condensate. And at higher density can be in general uh, described in terms of this uh, BCS state. 
And the, the, the symmetry breaking is due to the fact that this uh, E1S exciton is degenerate. In, uh, it is a bright exciton in lithium fluorite, and it is a threefold degenerate. And um, the, the self-consistent solution of uh, this Hamiltonian picks up a specific direction of the, the polarization, which is associated to this coherent exciton. Now, one way to, to look at uh, this state uh, is uh, to study the, the time of the Arpes signature. So in, formally, one can uh, construct uh, the Arpes, sin Arpes uh, signature from this uh, G lesser green function. And in particular, in, uh, within this uh, procedure, uh, the G lesser green function can be constructed uh, from the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian at equilibrium uh, and the eigenstate of this uh, non-equilibrium Hamiltonian. So one can construct the G lesser and then via Fourier transform with respect to the, the relative time coordinates, uh, the one gets the Arpes signal. Uh, excuse, excuse me, David. Yep. Sure. Uh, Claudio wants to ask a, a question. He asked me if you can interrupt. So maybe you want yeah, to yeah, ask sure. Claudio? So yeah, I didn't hear much of the question. Ah, maybe, maybe we, you come back to the previous slide. Yep, sure. This one? So this is the chemical, the different, uh, you are, uh, in practice you are making like, uh, so you are removing some electrons and put them in the, con so well, convalence and putting them in conduction. I think, I mean, if you look at this Hamiltonian, the way you can, you can think is that these two terms are basically closing the gap. So uh, this is what people call uh, quasi equilibrium distribution like the books quasi. So it, it's similar. Uh, and I mean, you really get, a, let's say, quasi equilibrium distribution in the moment that these two chemical potential, uh, the difference in particular, arrives to the quasi particle gap. Then in, in such case, the, let's say, the electron uh, chemical potential is in the conduction band and the all uh, chemical potential is in the valence band. And then you can think that you are putting electrons uh, in conduction and those in valence. But here, the important part is that uh, uh, well uh, before that you reach this uh, moment, when the chemical potential, uh, the two are still in the gap, uh, you have uh, this phase transition. And this is due to the, the presence of the, the self energy and uh, the electron or binding energy. I mean, in, in practice, you are really closing the gap. You take the, the material, you close the gap, and when you arrive uh, to a gap which is uh, closer to the exciton binding energy, there is a spontaneous phase transition to an excitonic insulator. OK. OK, so I was saying we can construct this uh, Arpes spectral function, and we can have a look to it uh, through the phase transition. Now, the first check is uh, what happens if I take a point uh, before the phase transition and uh, I get what uh, one would expect. So the system is still uh, in the equilibrium situation and I can see the valence uh, band structure. So this is uh, a consistency check. And then instead, when I cross this phase transition, uh, this is what happens. So the first point, I still have uh, the signal from the valence band, but now I have some extra signal in this region which is uh, below the conduction band. So here is the conduction band and here is the, the Arpes signature. And uh, this distance between uh, the minimum of the conduction band uh, and uh, the feature in the Arpes is exactly the exciton binding energy, this uh, lithium fluoride. And then if I increase uh, the density, which means I increase the chemical potential, one thing that I see is that the, the signal is bending and this is a fingerprint of uh, the fact that it's a, a broken symmetry state. So if you look here, uh, I'm plotting uh, along the L gamma L prime line, and uh, the signal is, uh, is not symmetric in between the two points. And then further increasing the density, what I also see is that the, the concavity of this signal is bending. So at very low density, I basically have a replica of the valence band, and then instead increasing the density, the the concavity is going upward. And this is very similar to what happens in materials which have a, what is called an excitonic insulator phase in the ground state. And of course, the signal which is here in the conduction region is somehow subtracted from the valence region. So here at low density, I cannot see that because 
the signal from the valence is uh, much stronger, but I start to see that increasing the density and in particular here, uh, the, the signal in the valence band is uh, changing and it's also lower because there is some signal taken, taken from the conduction band. Now, all this is nice, but it's obtained via this, uh, let's say, strange procedure where uh, we modify the Hamiltonian. Uh, the, the idea is that one can uh, try to get the same uh, via real time simulation. So, uh, in this uh, second part, I, dis I will discuss uh, what happens if I do a real time simulation and how is the signal of uh, time resolved darkness. So, let me acknowledge that uh, I will use the code which was developed uh, 10 years ago now from uh, Claudio Taccaliti, Mirta Gruning, and Andrea Marini. And that in particular, the theory for uh, non-equilibrium accidents in real time was already in this first paper, uh, again done by Enrico Perfetto and Gianluca Stefanucci. And in uh, this new one, I'm just uh, basically taking the theory and doing it uh, fully ab initio. So the idea is that this time I'm not solving self-consistently the let's say the Hamiltonian, the R3x Hamiltonian, but I'm really propagating the equation of motion still with the R3x self-energy. So somehow the role of the chemical potential is replaced by a real laser pulse with a frequency, which is omega pump, the pump of the frequency of the laser. And okay, we already know from uh, this PRB of 2011 that if we propagate this equation of motion, we get a time dependent polarization and we take the Fourier transform and we get an absorption spectrum, which is uh, exactly the same as the, the one of the beta salpeter equation. And in particular, uh, this uh, real time propagation generates a polarization which is associated uh, to the off diagonal uh, elements of the density matrix. So in this sense, it, it is uh, still similar to this coherent excitonic state uh, I was discussing uh, before. Now, from the real-time simulation, I can also construct uh, the, the ARPES signal. It is uh, a bit more involved, the procedure. I have to take uh, the whole history of the density matrix uh, and then construct the retarded and advanced propagators with, via this uh, time-ordered integral. And then uh, I can use the GKBA to construct the GLSR TT prime. And GKBA in this case is exact because I'm using a static self energy. So in, really in this procedure, the only approximation is the choice of the self energy. So again, I get the, the ARPES signal. I can, uh, I can have a look to it. So first, uh, a consistency check again. I consider the case where I put my, the, the frequency of my laser pulse above the, the band gap of the system. And then in this case, uh, I expect that uh, the, the pulse has enough energy to take selectrons from the valence and put them in the conduction band. And indeed, this is what I see. And uh, it is interesting also that the, the signal is exactly where uh, the conduction band is crossing the replica of the valence band, band shifted by the pump frequency. So I can interpret the signal just as carriers in the conduction band, but also this picture that the, the signal is a replica of the valence band is still holding. And, oops, sorry. Indeed, if I now change the frequency of my pump pass and I tune, uh, tune it resonant with the excitonic peak, I get a signal uh, which is uh, a replica of the valence band, but uh, well below the, the position of the conduction band. So this signal is very similar to what are, are called the Floquet replica in, uh, in the literature, for example. But the difference is that uh, this one will survive uh, also after the end of the pump pulse because the system is absorbing light. And so the, the, the non-equilibrium state will remain there. And of course, this kind of signal cannot be described in terms of uh, electrons uh, somewhere on the conduction band because it's completely off. So both in the, in the case with real-time simulations and in the case with this uh, non-equilibrium Hamiltonian, uh, we get uh, this uh, fingerprint of the excitonic state, uh, which is uh, a signal below the conduction band and uh, with a distance. Uh, uh, from the conduction band, which is the exciton binding energy, and with a shape, which is uh, a replica of the valence band. Now, one can, one can um, 
can also try to further uh, play with the equations, especially in the low density regime, so in, uh, in the self-consistent procedure. And it, it can be shown that at low density, the signal has this shape. So there is really this delta, which is the replica of the valence band shifted by the, the excitonic peak. And the intensity is modulated by the excitonic wave function. And indeed, this result was uh, already present in the literature. It was derived, uh, let's say, starting from, uh, uh, not, not from many body perturbation theory, but in a different way. And in general, uh, this was the signal derived for uh, non-coherent states. So here, uh, at variance to with the case above, you have a, a general non-coherent population of excitons. And OK, there is a, a, a small difference is that uh, here you just have the summation of one uh, conduction band index, while here we have two different. So the, and, uh, the signal from these two equations is exactly the same if one takes uh, for the thermal state a, a population which is very much picked at the, a specific excitonic state. This is discussed in this paper by Kemper. Uh, let me also remark that uh, this, uh, this kind of signal has been recently measured, uh, at least by two experimental groups. The one is, uh, one is the group of uh, Ralph and Stoffel. Here you, you see the time resort DARPS uh, ARPES uh, measurement uh, on uh, bulk WSE2. So here on the left, uh, you see the ARPES signal in one case when you pump a resonant to the excitonic case state. And in another case, when you pump above uh, and you inject uh, electrons in the conduction band. And what it is nicer that they, they try to do experimentally is the, that they take the signal in case space uh, and then they Fourier transform it to get the excitonic wave function, since the signal is proportional to the square modulus of the excitonic wave function. And uh, a similar experiment has been done also in the group by Danny Keshav. In the, there are these uh, two nice papers where this time it's still uh, WSE2, but this time the monolayer. So it has a bigger binding energy and they can uh, resolve better the distance from the excitonic signal and the conduction band. Okay, and then I move to another part where I try to discuss uh, how we can uh, detect uh, the excitons created by a laser pulse via transient absorption signal. And uh, I call this uh, exciton light interaction. And in this case, so for uh, describing this kind of experiment, uh, I, I'm still relying uh, on the real time propagation module that we have in the YAMBO code. But in particular, in this case, it is important to use uh, the theory of the Berry phase uh, polarization out of equilibrium. And the reason is that in, in this kind of experiments, what uh, one detects uh, are uh, signal beyond the linear response regime. So the, the Berry phase formulation is needed for that. And I will discuss uh, some results which are in, uh, in this paper and some other results on which, uh, which are not yet published and are part of a collaboration in the, with uh, Claudio Taccalite and uh, Marco D'Alessandro. So transient absorption, I still have my equation of motion for the density matrix with my pump pulse. And one way to get a transient absorption is to take the non-equilibrium density matrix generated by the pump pulse and to plug it in, in, a, in a response function, which can be defined as a functional of this density matrix. So to, to do that, the one has to introduce the, an adiabatic approximation. So one assumes that uh, the signal at a given time uh, de depends adiabatically on the density matrix at that time tau. And this, uh, we, we discussed this uh, in uh, this work with, uh, again, Enrico Perfetto, Gianluca Stefanucci, and Andrea Marini. And in particular, uh, this approximation is good if one assumes that uh, the pump pulse is creating uh, mostly carriers. So the important part of the density matrix is the diagonal, NN, which is slowly uh, changing in time. While the off-diagonal, uh, one can uh, assume it is not important and, take, and send it to zero. So in such cases, it's reasonable to have uh, an adiabatic signal. However, so this, uh, this kind of formulation describes uh, a signal uh, in function of carriers out of equilibrium. And uh, as you see, the 
it is difficult to, to have a, a description in kind uh, in terms of an excitonic population. So to avoid this procedure, the alternative is uh, to propagate a second equation, which is the same as before, but this time with the pump and the probe pass. So actually to, to really do the procedure, which is done experimentally to collect a transient signal. So one can do these two propagations and take the polarization, the polarization in presence of the pump and the probe and the polarization in presence of the pump alone. And then via the Fourier transform, uh, one can obtain again the, the dipole-dipole response function. And while here uh, we have to go through this adiabatic approximation, in this case, it's an exact procedure up to the choice of uh, the self-energy, of course. And here I want to, sh to show again, uh, to compare what happens if I take lithium fluoride and I compare uh, the signal with, generated with these uh, two procedures. Now, first case, uh, Let's say first case, I take my pump pass above uh, the band gap of the material. And in this case, uh, the two signals are exactly the same. So the, the picture in, in which I'm creating carriers out, out of equilibrium, this one is, uh, is reproducing almost exactly this, uh, this simulation. And then the second case, uh, as for the excitonic, uh, for the ARPES signal, we move uh, the pump frequency to, to be resonant with the excitonic peak. And in this case, the idea is that we are not creating carriers, but excitons. And indeed here, you, we see that there are differences in between the two procedures. I have to say that the differences are not uh, very much pronounced, but in any case, uh, so for example, the, the signal at the first excitonic peak is more intense in the exact procedure. And here there is uh, an opposite signal uh, uh, at this second uh, excitonic peak, it corresponds to this peak. Now, why one can try to to model this signal and to figure out uh, what which is the role of excitons. So the first idea is, uh, can I write this signal uh, as a function of some uh, excitonic population? And uh, to do that, I can uh, start with a kind of uh, bosonic approximation. Just I take the the propagator of uh, a boson with a finite population. And the answer is that this is not going to give a, a transient signal. And the reason is that the, the propagator has this shape where the population enters here and here, but these two terms will cancel exactly and one will get exactly the same signal from equilibrium. So it is not possible to, to describe this signal just taking the exciton as a boson. And the reason for that is that uh, in this situation, experimentally, they have created uh, a state with a finite population of excitons. And then uh, what they probe uh, is the possibility for the transition from this state uh, to this other state where they add one extra exciton. And uh, the energy cost to add one extra exciton is, uh, is exactly the same uh, independently on the, the number of excitons present in the initial state. Uh, if we assume that exciton are uh, non-interacting bosons uh, as in the approximation above. So in this case, uh, the, the only way to get, let's say an exact signal is really to, to do the experimental procedure uh, with both the pump pass and the probe pass. Now, instead here I discuss uh, another case where instead uh, I still look at transient absorption, but I focus uh, on uh, the probe on a, a low energy range in between zero and two EV. And the idea is that in this energy range, uh, I might observe a signal from the created uh, excitonic, K, excitonic state when I pump here to other excitonic states. So here is a zoom uh, of the excitonic peaks in uh, or, uh, the excitonic poles in lithium fluoride. There are two bright uh, excitons, the first one, which is I label one, and this one, which I label four. And then there are also other four bright excitons, two, three, five, and six. And again, I want to compare these two procedures. Now, what, what I see is that the, these first procedures give me pulse in the transit absorption, which are exactly at the energy difference between one exciton and the other. So this should be omega lambda, omega lambda prime. When instead, these, uh, the procedure in terms of carriers is not able to, 
to describe uh, anything like that, uh, it, it, it would have posed just as the energy difference between electrons in conduction or eventually yeah, electrons in balance. And then the, the other nice aspect of, uh, of this kind of calculations is that uh, the transition are from the first bright exciton to two dark excitons. So this is also a way to, to assess experimentally dark excitons. And I can also play with the polarization of my pump and my probe in the simulations and uh, of the polarization I detect. And for example, if I take the polarization of the pump perpendicular to the one of the probe, I get transition towards uh, two other dark excitons. So I, I can also explore different dark, dark excitons in the system. And now again, also in this regime, one can ask, uh, can I formulate everything uh, in terms of, uh, of some uh, excitonic population? And, uh, and in this case, the answer is uh, yes. So what I can think is that uh, I start from a state uh, with a given exciton, and uh, I have a transition to a state with uh, another exciton. So if I take these two states and uh, I plug them inside some lemma representation of my dipole-dipole response function, uh, I, I can uh, write something like that. Uh, and in particular for the residuals, I get an expression for this uh, uh, interaction of the field with the, the light via these uh, electronic dipoles, which is a rotation of the conduction, conduction and balance, balance dipoles via the excitonic wave function. And here it's important to stress that I will have both uh, interband and intraband transitions. And as you know well, uh, to get intraband dipoles is problematic in periodic boundary conditions. In particular, we can get just a part of the dipoles, which is the, this term. I mean, you can find this in, uh, in many papers, but it is hard to, to get the exact dipole. So one idea is the, to move from uh, the length to the velocity gauge, so to, to replace the position operator with the velocity operator. And uh, in such case, I, I have the same terms, but I, I'm able to compute the, also the, the intraband dipoles. And I can, uh, again, compare this expression with the full real-time propagation. And this is the result. So here you see, the, the transient absorption signal in red from uh, real-time propagation. This is the same as before, just with a smaller smearing. And then uh, the same signal, which I obtain uh, via this expression. And the signal are very similar, although they are not the same, uh, but this difference, uh, I think it's due to the problems related to the velocity gauge and in particular to the rotation of uh, the velocity operator from the single particle picture to the excitonic picture because uh, the operator should be changed. Instead, I'm just rotating the single particle operator. Okay, uh, I don't know, Arian, do, you have more time? do I have more time or uh, I should stop here? Uh, I don't know. How much time do you need? Oh, uh, I think uh, five minutes, uh, even a bit more, but uh, I can even stop here. Uh, I don't want to, to take too much. Yeah, uh, maybe we can, we can, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, if it's five minutes, it's okay, I think, but uh, oh, okay. so time I, for discussion. Okay, I try to be super quick, just, uh, so in this last part, uh, I just want to jump from, uh, let's say, exit on light to exit on phone interaction. And uh, I will discuss very quickly, uh, let's say, an ab initial formulation of exit on phone coupling, uh, let's say, analytical, that, uh, uh, we did in collaboration of Marco Bernardi, and indeed the most of the work was done uh, by Chen, uh, who was a student in Marco Group. And uh, and then instead I will show also a few results on uh, how one can define exciton phone on coupling just by finite differences, let's say, in collaboration with experimental groups. So for exciton phone on coupling, just very quick, I want to stress that. Uh, the expression of the exciton phonon coupling matrix element is very similar in a way to this uh, one I was introducing of uh, about uh, exciton like coupling. Just one change is uh, these uh, dipoles, which couples uh, electrons with light, with the electron phonon matrix elements, and uh, the exciton phonon coupling can be defined. Of course, exciton phonon coupling is much more involved than exciton light because there is the the momentum of the phonon as well. 
So, uh, and then uh, also the momentum of the exiton enters. So one needs uh, the exiton at finite momentum uh, and uh, to take into account uh, the scattering from one Q to the other Q prime. And one with, with this coupling, for example, it is possible to, to compute the exciton for non lifetimes with this equation where uh, the lifetime is due to uh, of a scattering process from uh, an exciton at lambda through towards another exciton at lambda prime uh, via a phonon. And for example, here you get that if you take an exciton uh, at the minimum, uh, let's say, of the excitonic dispersion, this is the excitonic dispersion of HBN. Uh, you get uh, a very short lifetime. And I mean, this kind of uh, equation of derivation, and in particular, the exciton phonon matrix elements, uh, it is in this uh, work we did, but it was also, it's also available in the literature. There are, uh, uh, at least uh, there, is, there has been an archive from uh, Gabriel Antonius, uh, and then I know that also Pierluigi Gudazzo is working on that. Uh, and there are also other works by Claudio Taccalite, Fulvio Paleari in this direction. Uh, and I mean, this is a, an analytical expression, but it's very demanding. Uh, an alternative way to, to describe uh, exciton phonon coupling is by finite difference. So the idea is that one can solve the beta salpeter with the atoms at equilibrium, the beta salpeter with atoms displaced, uh, and somehow describe the coupling of uh, excitonic peaks. Uh, with uh, atomic displacement. And this numerically we do via a procedure which uh, was developed by, in particular by Enrique Miranda in his PhD thesis using a Python script, Python scripting tools. And uh, it's uh, something that can be measured experimentally again in pump and probe experiments. So for example, here in this experiment, they, they send a laser pulse on uh, molybdenum disulfite and what they see is that the signal is uh, oscillating coherently with uh, a specific period, uh, which can be associated to a phonon. And uh, this kind of oscillation can be described solving the beta salpeter uh, at equilibrium and out of equilibrium and see how the excitonic peak moves. Well, in this case, is uh, a peak in the continuum, indeed, is this C peak. Uh, okay, well, we have done that in another experiment. I, I skipped that. Uh, and just uh, to mention that uh, further developments, uh, presently there is a project to describe exciton phonon coupling in real time via RMFS dynamics. So to couple the R3 plus X equation uh, via an equation for the classical ions. And it's a project uh, on which Fulvio Paleari is working. And then I also mentioned this work where uh, I've, uh, well, let's see. We, we wrote the equation for uh, coherent uh, excitons coupled to an equation for uh, excitonic populations. Okay, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Davide, for this nice talk. Um, so if you have questions, uh, please go to the reaction section and, uh, and raise your hand. Uh, okay, so there's a question from Pina. Yeah, so uh, actually it's a simple question uh, about the fact that you use um, um, the formalism based on the berry phase when you want mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to study this uh, nonlinear effect. So why do you need, uh, I mean, this is also a question that I would have asked later. <laughs> Yeah. In our discussion. So, why do you need uh, to go to the Berry phase? Uh, yeah, the, the reason is that we. Symmetrics? So, I mean, this is the. Let me go. Sorry. So, this is the equation we propagate, and we have the, the density matrix. Uh, and then from the density matrix, we need to reconstruct the polarization. And these are, cannot be done exactly. So, there is not an equation which defines. Uh, the, the many body polarization in terms of the density matrix. So we can do that in an approximate way, which holds uh, to first order. But then if you want to go beyond the first order, you, you need something else. And the reason is that the, the polarization of a material is uh, a many body operator and cannot be described just by this uh, density matrix, which is able to capture one body operators. So, or, so you mean you need the current so the current would be an alternative. If you directly want the, the polarization, then you, you need to go through the, 
let's say, to, through the Berry phase. An alternative path would be to compute the current. You can define exactly the current via the density matrix, and this you can do. And then eventually you can, uh, from the current, you can, for example, integrate in time and get the polarization. Exactly, that's my point. I mean, uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, this would work, but then the point is uh, that the polarization enters also here in this uh, external operator. In the, the, I mean, the coupling of the external field uh, with the laser pulse. And then in such case, uh, again, if you want to stay in the, in the length gauge, let's say, you need uh, the berry phase. Otherwise, what you can do is you switch to the velocity gauge, gauge you introduce uh, a vector potential. This you can okay. do. But then, uh, I mean, as you know, you have uh, some troubles because you have to, to enforce the summer rules. So otherwise uh, you have issues with the velocity. And then another point is that you introduce a vector potential and then you have to, to gauge your yes. pseudo potential, which is in the yes. equation. Yes. So in principle, you can do that, but in practice, it's not easy. Okay, and it's just, uh, if I can, so, so the formulation with the Berry phase is, uh, um, uh, is, um, perturbative formulation in the sense that uh, you, can you treat any external <laughs> potential? So I would say, uh, yeah, the, the experts are uh, Claudio and Mirta. Claudio. Then, I mean, you have work. no linear effects, but to, to I mean, it's, uh, um, you can do it uh, at any strength of the external potential also when it's very strong and that perturbative uh, expansion does not uh, hold. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not perturbative, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, uh, I just had a quick question on the, uh, how you deal with the carrier concentration uh, in practice in the calculation, because then you get indeed, as you mentioned, these interbound terms. Um, so you want me to do, to this, give some details in general? Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean. So, uh, I mean, what happens is that you, you really propagate the equation of motion, and if uh, the frequency of the pump pulse is resonant uh, with the, uh, some peaks in absorption, you, you get, let's say, a time-dependent density matrix, which is, will change. And then depending on the intensity of the, the pulse, uh, this will give uh, a different amount of change in the, in the density matrix. And then you can associate uh, somehow the trace uh, of the density matrix in the conduction set core to the number of uh, the density of carriers you, you have created. I, I'm not sure if this was the question. Yes, I think so. so okay, so it's something that uh, emerges naturally. It's not, it's not you who, it's not- uh... Yeah, it's not something you define. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. in particular, yeah. It, it depends on the, I mean, you define the intensity of, the, of your uh, laser pass. Okay. And so then all these interbound contributions, are they included or not? Or uh... I, I would say that these uh, interbound contribution are, uh, I mean, are again, the, the, the kind of contribution that you can include uh, if you go beyond this, uh, this density matrix formulation and you either uh, go through the Berry phase formulation or uh, which is what I did for the transit absorption or you go to the velocity gauge. Okay. So, so yeah, indeed, yeah, I'm cheating a bit because so this is the, the equation of motion without the Berry phase, I should have written also the one with the Berry phase case. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's a question from uh, Sangeeta, please go ahead. Hi, Davide, that was an excellent Hi. talk. Thank um, you. I, ha I have a question. So if you come in with a laser pulse and you create the excitons, can you comment about the time at which these excitons are formed? Is there a delay between the pulse and the formation of an exciton? So I would say that in my equation, there is not a delay because I have uh, the, this uh, static self energy. So R3 plus X, uh, it, it is a static and uh, everything is instantaneous. Uh, I would say that in, in, in real life or uh, in an exact calculation, one could expect some delay, which could be related to the buildup of the screening. But since here I, I take uh, this R plus sex self energy, which is static, uh, and on top of that, I keep the screening uh, frozen at the equilibrium value, I don't have any delay. 
Okay, so you expect it to be the inverse of the absorption that that gives you the time scale roughly. Yeah, yeah, we can say mm -hmm. so. Okay, yeah, thanks. But I mean, I think this is a very interesting topic. So the, the time it takes an accident to, to build up, uh, but uh, yeah, ab initio, we are not able yet to, to do that. I think with uh, some uh, simulation of models with dynamical self energies, it would be possible to address this issue. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Don't see them. Uh, yeah, maybe I just had a quick, I, I don't know, uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, you mentioned some experiments that were done to, to capture the same kind of physics that you described. Yeah. This uh, are there any, but any quantitative comparisons, have, are they possible or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they are. So indeed in this, uh, in this work, as you see, the, there is Anger Rubio and uh, Anne Subner. So uh, I think they did some, uh, some comparisons and in particular about uh, this uh, excitonic wave function. But yeah, I cannot, I think I, I cannot answer about the details. So here below, I just can say that here below in these two panels, uh, you can see the, the experimental signal as a function of K and then the simulated one, which I guess is the excitonic wave function. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, the nice thing is that they can really measure the excitonic wave function. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, any other uh, means of getting the excitonic wave function experimentally. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, last chance for questions. I don't see any, so maybe this is a good point to, to stop. So thanks again, Davide, for this nice, uh, nice overview. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for participating and, uh, and see you next time. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.